What's up everybody, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. You're watching Careers in Medicine, a video series that I've created to explore specialties and subspecialties in medicine. On today's episode, I'm interviewing Dr. Tao Xu, a hospitalist and the medical director of Mount Sinai International about her experience in the COVID-19 pandemic. I should mention the views and opinions expressed in this episode do not represent those of Mount Sinai Hospital. Let's get started. My name is Tao Xu. I work at Mount Sinai Hospital in a division of hospital medicine. I am a hospitalist. Um, I uh, split my time between seeing patients with either with our nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, or our residents and medical students. Um, and also I split my time between clinical work and my administrative work as a medical director for Mount Sinai International. So typically, pre-COVID, during non-COVID era, our hospitalized inpatient medicine uh, population include those with heart failure, uh, patients with COPD as exacerbation, asthma exacerbation, various, um, a variety of sepsis, you know, any source of bacteremia, you know, pneumonia, pulmonary infections, uh, renal infections, abdominal infections. During the peak of COVID era, um, we definitely co are concentrated in just COVID-related respiratory failure. And of course, there are other comorbidities related to those, you know, respiratory failure patients with COVID because it kind of expands to your other organs. So they will come in with other organ dysfunctions, but the primary issue is COVID-related respiratory failure. And that's something that I think was very unique during this time is that there's, there's, it's a lot, there's a lot of pulmonary disease and there's a lot of hypoxia versus before, you know, all those things that we were seeing with, you know, renal failure, heart failure exacerbation, various other bacterial sepsis. It can't be, it, 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 we still see them included uh, with our COVID patients, but definitely is not, you know, the, 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 the biggest group. There is a lot of COVID related uh, renal failure, especially in our patients who, you know, we ended up going to the intensive care unit and then we inherit them after they improve a bit and come to us. Um, you know, there's, a, there's quite a num number of patients who are young and, you know, develop multi-organ failure from COVID and come back and become, you know, uh, for a period of time dependent on dialysis <clears throat> because their kidneys are not functioning. Um, another big one I would say is uh, um, encephalopathy as a complication of uh, COVID disease. Um, this is definitely, I think our patients who are older are, are more at risk for it. So if they already are you know, elderly and perhaps has some, um, you know, um, maybe some dementia or just being elderly, um, I think there's, we see a lot of sequelae, neurologic sequelae where they're encephalopathic for a very prolonged period of time. Uh, for a supervising role during COVID, I start around six something just to see the census of the team, to check what the patient's geography is, who are the new patients, are they appropriately assigned to the team by geography, are they close to CAB, do we need to shift some patients around? So we'll try to do that before seven o'clock when the team actually start, um, you know, printing out their list and seeing patients. And then because as a supervising hospitalist, since we're not providing direct care, but the expectation is that it's as if we are providing direct care through the eyes of our teams being supervised. So we have anywhere between three to four teams that we supervise and each team have anywhere between, let's say 12 to 14 patients. So in the next from seven to 10, essentially, I will go through the chart for every single patient for those three to four teams. As if I were the attending that's going to be rounding. Some of the non-medicine physicians, uh, providers that are rotating through, you know, they may be P 
pediatricians, they may be neurologists, they may be dermatologists, they may not have um, you know, touched internal medicine or anything beyond their specialty for many, many years. And you know, we need to make sure that we can answer all of their questions, we can look at all the nitty gritty medicine stuff that they're, you know, they're not used to looking at, especially for inpatients. So we have to be very detail oriented for several hours looking through all the patients. And then we have to pay attention to all the non-clinical details, logistics, especially when it comes to things like goals of care, which a lot of non-inpatient physicians are not used to doing. And sometimes, you know, you know, even some outpatient physicians who could do this, you know, um, over a period of time with their patients in, a, in an outpatient setting may not be comfortable doing this in a very fast paced, urgent, last minute way, given how, you know, the severity of COVID and we're encountered with situations where people can be fine one day and then 12 hours later it's decompensating. So they, they, may be, they may not be comfortable with this rapid progressive end of life discussion. So we have, be, we have to be very mindful of that and be involved. So that's kind of the next few hours. And then when the teams are ready to run the list with me, I need to make sure that I have you know, reviewed all the patients, have a plan in my head, and have, you know, for each patient, a few bullet points I wanna ask the team, and then listen to them talk about the patient, run the list. And, it, and you have to be flexible as a supervising hospitalist because some teams are extremely independent. You know, the attendings are very familiar with inpatient work, depending on their specialty. They may have a very strong group of residents or frontline providers, and, they only want to touch base with you regarding questions that they have. What saves time and what we're, why we're able to supervise multiple teams is that um, unfortunately we don't have to face to face time that we have with, with the patients. And I think that's something that we rely on the team to tell us. And, and, and I think that's a, I think you'll get to that question later, but you know, I'm sure we're gonna talk about the challenge of being a supervising hospitalist is that I, I'm, I'm not laying eyes on the patient and I'm relying on someone else to tell me, does he look overloaded? You know, where's the wound, right? But that does save time because on average, if you're spending 15, 20 minutes with a patient or even more sometimes, when that's gone and you're just chart checking and, but of course you're thinking about the patient, but if you're just chart checking, you know, going through like 30, 40 charts is time consuming, but definitely not as time consuming as directly talking to the patient and seeing them. You know, this is a time where we're seeing a lot of people dying. There's a lot of people who are critically ill. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, that are hospitalized here, even not dying, but not able to see their family members, you know, visiting them as they normally would pre-COVID if they were here for a regular pneumonia. And I think it's very tough for our staff to go through so many, you know, within one deployment, which could be four days or eight days, within one deployment, seeing, you know, so many patients at the end of their life, having a lot of those tough conversations, a lot of tough decisions. And, and I think that being there emotionally for the team as a, as a form of support. I think I, I find that really valuable in what I do. I think there's a lot of people who come from a lot of different places and willing to share their time, willing to share their dedication, willing to share their compassion to helping others and coming together. And, you know, people are so, uh, people are so modest and humble during this time. And, and I don't know if um, other people feel the same way I do that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are brought into a, um, a scenario that they're not comfortable with before, even ourselves, right? In internal medicine, no one has treated COVID before this year. And this is something that's brand new to us in any country, in any state, right? And we are all kind of uh, brought together, having to put our efforts in, having to throw our brains together and our skills together, use whatever we know to take care of these patients and take care of each other. Everyone try to do whatever they can 
through food, through their skills, through their you know training for something they're not used to. I I think it really showed us that you know when something happens, when a pandemic happens、um, anywhere, you know people are willing to kind of throw aside everything and then jump in. So it's very heartwarming. I think even though this is such an unfortunate time, but I think it was so heartwarming to see that you know the goodness in everyone's heart. Well, that wraps up this episode of Careers in Medicine. If you have any feedback, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. And if you'd like to subscribe, go ahead and click the button right here. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.